At the turn of the 20th century, LaMarcus Adna Thompson debuted the Gravity Pleasure Switchback Railway in Coney Island, New York, to great success. Amusement parks began to sprout up across the country, each with the desire to build the most thrilling, exciting, and, most importantly, profitable coaster around. While exciting in their time, technological limitations prevented these coasters from being true thrill machines by today's standards. In 1912, one of, if not the most important moment in roller coaster history occurred, the invention of the upstop wheel, also known as the under friction wheel. This set of wheels hugs the bottom of the rail, essentially locking coaster cars to the track. Gone were the scenic railway and side friction days, where gentle dips and turns were the norm. The upstop wheel primed the creative and technological explosion that occurred during the 1920s, the first coaster renaissance, the golden age of roller coasters. I'm Jay Natty Boy, and this is part two of my series on roller coaster history. The upstop wheel was patented by John Miller a legendary coaster engineer who we can thank for many different coaster features that still exist today, including the locking safety bar, a new necessity since, while upstop wheels prohibited cars from flying off the track, they did not prevent passengers from flying out of the train. One would assume that an explosion in coaster building would occur directly following these inventions in 1912, but the United States had some other things on their mind, notably a little something called World War I which took place from 1914 to 1918. At the end of the decade, post-war optimism was raging in America, and a bold new attitude swept over American citizens, with automobile driving park owners developing a ravenous appetite for stomach churning, rib crushing thrill rides, and roller coaster designers would not disappoint. This was the Roaring Twenties. In the Twenties, a new breed of roller coaster emerged, Coaster heights were pushing 100 feet, drops had become steeper, turns had become tighter, and track layouts had become convoluted and unpredictable, all thanks to John Miller's upstop wheel. The best way to appreciate the golden age is by taking a look at the designers, engineers, and companies that played major roles in this creative explosion. Yeah, we're not done with this guy yet. Not only did he invent the upstop wheel, the safety bar, and the anti-rollback chain dog that causes the clackety-clack noise on lift hills, but he was undeniably the most prolific coaster builder of the golden age. I mean, this guy's been nicknamed the master and the father of the high-speed coaster. He was that good. Miller got involved with coaster construction in the 1800s, working with none other than L.A. Thompson, the man who built what many considered to be the first modern roller coaster. In 1920, Miller teamed up with a contractor named Harry Baker, and the two began building coasters left and right. A standout feature of Miller's coasters were Camelback Hills, straight or slightly angled drops that went all the way to the ground, as well as wide, flat turnarounds. A few of Miller's creations still operate today, including Big Dipper at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, Jackrabbit at Kennywood, Jackrabbit at Seabreeze, Roller Coaster at Lagoon, and Racer at Kennywood. It's worth noting that, while the coaster designs became more creative in the 20s, coaster names did not. In the early 1900s, a talented engineer by the name of Fred Church was working in Venice Beach with John Miller and other notable coaster designers on boundary pushing side friction coasters. Eventually, Fred Church broke off to form a duo with his business partner, Frank Pryor, and together, the two introduced roller coasters the likes of which the world had never seen. While John Miller became known for his relatively straightforward designs featuring graceful camelback hills and wide turns, Fred Church made a name for himself by producing coasters with more daring and twisted layouts. Church created a new type of coaster train, a flexible one that could safely negotiate tight turns. He called these Bob's trains, as they were narrow, nine-car trains in which passengers sat one in front of the other like in a bobsled. In 1923, Church built the Giant Dipper at the Venice Amusement Pier in California. Featuring steep drops and banked turns, the ride was a hit. Church also developed a new and improved train that featured standard side-by-side -side seating, but was capable of navigating tight turns. 
These trains are very similar to the Millennium Flyer trains found on modern GCI coasters. In 1924, Fred Church built the Bobs at Riverview Park in Chicago, a park that featured many other coasters, including some designed by John Miller. The Riverview Bobs was so popular that it outgrossed the park's other coasters three to one. The public clearly wanted wilder, twistier, more extreme coasters, and other coaster designers took notice. Church created many Bob-style coasters during his career, including the legendary airplane coaster at Playland Park in Rye, New York, what some consider to have been the greatest coaster on the planet when it was demolished in 1957, the fabled Cyclone Racer at Long Beach, California, and the Cyclone at Revere Beach, Massachusetts. Only three Church-designed rides still operate today. The Giant Dipper at Belmont Park in San Diego is perhaps the best surviving example of a typical Church-designed ride, with swooping, bank turns, and steep drops. The Giant Dipper at Santa Cruz Beach and Boardwalk, and Dragon Coaster in Rye, New York, also still thrill riders today. While Church's designs were radical and intense, it's worth noting that his coasters remain comfortable due to the ride's heavily padded, serpentine-like trains that minimize the effects of lateral forces. If Church's coasters were intense, then our next designer's coasters were straight up violent. If you gave a hardcore roller coaster enthusiast a time machine and told them that they have to choose one coaster to go back in time and ride, odds are they'll choose one of Harry Traver's Cyclone Safety Coasters. After inventing numerous classic rides including the Circle Swing and the Tumble Bug, Harry Traver opened the Traver Engineering Company in 1919. In the early 1920s, his company acted as a contractor for, you guessed it, Fred Church and Frank Pryor, building several Bob's coasters in the process. But Harry was a dreamer, and he had bigger plans up his sleeve. Traver used the knowledge he gained while working with Church to create his own death wish of a coaster, featuring modified Bob's trains, steel supports, 100-foot high lift hills, and absurdly banked drops and turns. Harry Traver unleashed his cyclone safety coasters onto the world, and the world would never be the same. Only three of these contraptions were built: one at New Jersey's Palisades Park one at Revere Beach near Boston, Massachusetts, and a third at Crystal Beach in Ontario, Canada. One click glance is enough to tell you just how extreme these rides were. Rider injuries were common on these coasters, including fractured ribs and broken collarbones. The rides were so violent that the Crystal Beach Cyclone allegedly employed a nurse in the coaster station to tend to injured riders. The frequency of injuries naturally caused the ride to be quite popular with guests who were eager to see what all the fuss was about. Eventually, the number of people watching the rides greatly outnumbered those who were willing to ride them. This fact, combined with the constant maintenance required for rides that forceful, led to the Cyclones only operating for a few seasons, with the exception being Crystal Beach's Cyclone, which operated until 1945, only because the park couldn't afford to demolish it sooner than that. To this day, Harry Traver's giant cyclone safety coasters are considered to be among the most extreme coasters ever built, cementing Traver as a boundary-pushing pioneer in the coaster building business. Started not in Philadelphia, but in Germantown, Pennsylvania, circa 1904, the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, or PTC, originally manufactured carousels and toboggan-style rides. Today, PTC is well known for their wooden coasters, many of which were constructed during the Golden Age. Herbert Schmeck, the former apprentice of the master John Miller himself, helped make PTC a coaster-building powerhouse during the Golden Age. Schmeck designed the Wildcat series of coasters as a direct competitor to Pryor and Church's Bob's coasters. Famous Wildcats include the Idora Park Wildcat and the Lakeside Park Wildcat. And although no PTC Wildcats still operate today, they played a huge role in the Golden Age coaster wars. Two Golden Age era Schmeck design rides that still operate today are Thunderhawk at Dorney Park and Yankee Cannonball at Canopy Lake Park in New Hampshire. PTC would survive the Depression and continue to build coasters with Schmeck at the helm well into the post-World War II years. Mm -hmm. 
Vernon Keenan is most famous for designing the Coney Island Cyclone, one of the most well-known and iconic coasters on the planet. Built in 1927, the famous aviator Charles Lindbergh reportedly described his experience riding the Cyclone as, quote, greater than flying an airplane at top speed. The ride has inspired the layout of many coasters around the world, including Viper at Six Flags Great America and Bandit at Movie Park Germany. Vernon Keenan didn't really design any other noteworthy coasters, but come on, he designed the Cyclone. I had to include him. In the year 1928 alone, nearly 40 major roller coasters were constructed at parks across America. The Golden Age was at its most golden, and nothing seemed like it could scuff it up. That is, until the stock market crash of 1929 brought the Roaring Twenties to a whimpering halt. In the next episode of the series, we'll explore this dark period in coaster history that would prove crippling for many parks, and take a look at the role of amusement parks in post-World War II era America. Interestingly, many of today's most beloved wooden coasters were built during these dark decades between the two coaster golden ages. Finally, we'll look at how a new amusement park concept introduced in the 50s would forever change not only the coaster industry, but the amusement industry as a whole. Let me know in the comments below if you've ridden any of these golden age coasters. Oh, and be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the video. If you really enjoyed the video, consider hitting that subscribe button. Until next time, Thanks for watching.